Hi, everyone. Thanks again for coming to listen. Uh, my name is Walt. I'm a student at Oberlin College. My name is Benjamin. I am a student at Bowdoin. And today we're going to be talking to you guys a little bit about the border wildlife study and vegetation surveys we did alongside it. Also, if it's a little bit windy or you hear cars running past, we are next to a major roadway. So we apologize in advance for that. So the purposes of the border wildlife study primary, primarily are to document biodiversity and to track wildlife presence and wildlife movement in habitats along the border region using camera traps. Um, and here we actually have a couple photos from the camera traps from Sky Island of the Lions. You can see a mountain lion on the top right and a bobcat on the bottom right. Um, but another part of the border wildlife study are the vegetation surveys that we've done, which give us a more detailed look at the plant makeup of various different habitats along the border wall region. Um, another two photos here on the left. On the top, we have from the eastern edge of our study area, we have a picture from directly next to the border wall. And below that, from the far right edge of our study area, we see newly blasted border roads where new sections of the border wall were going to be created. To talk a little bit more about our study site, um, this is the area we were surveying. You can see all of these orange points at the bottom are our camera trapping locations. There were 48 of them across six blocks. Um, there was another block uh, with eight more cameras in Mexico, but due to COVID restrictions, that wasn't a part of our current survey. Um, but here in the bottom section of this zoomed in map, you can see there is a diverse range of elevational gradients and habitats here. We've got uh, the Patagonia Mountains on the left, the San Rafael Valley in the middle, and the Huachuca Mountains on the right. And our camera locations, like I said, were spread across this region from west to east. So our procedure while we were doing these vegetation surveys, uh, primarily we were out there to collect SD cards and bring back photos to Sky Island Alliance for their border wildlife study. Um, changing batteries on the cameras, everything else to maintain them. Uh, but the main thing we were doing would be running 50 meter transect tapes along the ground, radiating out in each of the four cardinal directions away from the camera. Um, and in some circumstances, we would have another transect tape running in the line of sight of the camera. And we would walk along these transects, stopping every half meter to record the height of the canopy what plant form was present, whether it was a tree or a shrub or a succulent or a grass, and also specifically what plant species we saw at each half meter point. And over the month that us at Round River Conservation Studies were surveying, we collected over 20,000 data points. So now to get a little bit of what we actually found. Um, it was really incredible to have that experience. And we recently were able to actually go over the data and see uh, what's actually present in that area. So to kind of start off with this graph to get you oriented to all the different shapes and colors that are here. Uh, the top graph, A, you'll see that on the y-axis, on the vertical axis, it says percent cover. So you can see that based on the colors shown in the legend, um, if we're looking at, for example, site one in block 10, there's around just over 25% of canopy over two meters, then just a little sliver, maybe one or 2% of canopy one to two meters high. And then this little area around 15% of canopy that is less than one meter. And the rest, that kind of speckled block is bare ground or canopy that was zero centimeters tall. And you can see how that trend kind of carries out for the rest of the other blocks. Uh, blocks 10 and 11 had a bit more high canopy, which would be good shelter for larger animals. Um, whereas blocks 12, 13, and 14 mainly were characterized by canopy that was really primarily under one meter. Block 15, you go back to a little bit more of that uh, high canopy. You see that that trend plays out really nicely over the places that Walt mentioned were more mountainous in blocks 10 and 11 in the Patagonias and the western foothills of the Huachuca Mountains in block 15. And then going down, you can see in the summary of plant forms that plays out again with over two meters generally correlating with more tree cover in block 10 and 11. Then blocks 12, 13, and 14 really mainly being dominated by grass cover creating a sense of grasslands um, that are really unique now in this area since so many have been so deeply degraded. Block 15, again, we come back to having uh, pretty high tree cover. Um, another thing that's interesting in block 10, uh, it was one of the main places where we saw a substantial amount of cover 
by succulents, which are really important as a main, as a main water source for pollination, in addition to also being an important food source for herbivores like javelina, which you'll get a little sneak peek about at the end of our presentation. So what we found in terms of habitat types, now you can see that the colors correspond to habitat defining vegetation, which are mainly trees. So block 10 with the succulents was mainly mesquite scrub. Um, these are very important trees that act as nurse trees in more uh, arid regions. They bring up water from up to 60 meters underground. And that's something that is in short supply in the desert, as many of y'all know. Uh, block 11 in the Eastern part of the Patagonias was mainly mixed oak. And another interesting thing, there was a much higher amount of manzanita there. Um, manzanita produced these berries that are a huge part of the diet of black, boar, black bears, javelina, and other omnivores and herbivores who don't get a lot of fruit sometimes in dry years. Uh, and then blocks 12, 13, and 14 have pretty sparsely distributed trees, mainly grassland. Um, and we found actually that most of the trees were along drainages. So block 12, the Santa Cruz River, which forms the San Rafael Valley, flows uh, north-south right through there. And that was the main place where we saw really interesting riparian or uh, river area adapted trees, cottonwoods, desert willow, and walnuts. And then 15 again, we have mixed oak with a pretty even distribution of trees and grass. So we called it mixed oak grassland. Um, yeah. So now onto the animals. Some of y'all might have been waiting to see where the animals fit in here. So the places where that had the mountains ended up having typically the largest amount of sightings and then also abundance um, in different species of animals. So blocks 10, 11, and 15 really ended up being uh, standing out for that reason. You'll see that there are a lot of species in block 13, but that gray area is a, a, particular, um, a particular rodent that likes to use the wood right in front of one of the camera sites to, as a little like highway. Um, so that might've also skewed the results there. Um, but not to give, uh, I, don't, I wanna give San Rafael Valley some credit though, uh, because that was the only place where we saw animals like badgers, pronghorns and porcupines. Um, Whereas in blocks 10, 11, and 15, we saw more of the rare apex predators like black bears, pumas, um, then also a lot more white-tailed deer. Not an apex predator, but they're still pretty cool creatures. So now a new big complicated graph. You can see that we have sightings on the vertical axis, and this is log transformed. All you really need to know about that is that we had a lot of different sample sizes of sightings. So if there were like mule deer, which were like 2000 in some places, versus pumas, which are like 14. This allows them to be grouped closer together, basically. I don't know if that, um, it helps us make the graph look prettier, essentially. Um, grass covers on the, horizon the horizontal axis here, and then tree cover on the one here for herbivores and then predators. So to walk you through it a little bit, one of the really cool things that we saw that was the clearest, mule deer and white-tailed deer, the two main deer in this area, had pretty opposite trends um, in terms of their interest in grass cover. So mule deer were found a lot more in places that had higher grass cover, like in the San Rafael Valley, whereas white-tailed deer were much more common in places with more sparse grass cover. The other animals didn't have as clear relationships because this is still uh, just a year into the study. So despite all these data points, we still need a little bit more time to see what they really prefer, um, or maybe just more analyses. And in the predators, um, kind of as we mentioned before, black bears, gray foxes, and mountain lions, uh, they prefer moderate tree cover. Um, but you can see that there is a positive trend of them preferring spaces that have more tree cover. Again, we don't really have a lot of data points for them yet, so there's still a lot to be seen. Um, and then the mesopredators, the predators that had more medium body sizes, bobcats, coyotes, raccoons, they actually had a marked negative relationship to tree cover. So they ended up preferring spaces that were more grassy, like the San Rafael Valley. Um, there's still a lot more to be seen with this, but this is the stuff that we found so far. Yeah, so like Benjo just mentioned, uh, this survey as well as the border wildlife study camera trapping sites give us clear delineations of what habitat, habitat types exist, both at the single camera level and the regional scale as a whole. Um, the tree and grass cover types that we found uh, correlate a lot with the different wildlife populations that we're seeing in these regions that are affected by border wall construction and presence. Um, yeah. for at-risk species that are threatened by the border wall. Getting a sense of which habitats they like to frequent gives us an idea of which habitats we need to protect and conserve to make sure that these animal species are doing well. Yeah. And then think about what's next. We could, once data starts becoming more, once you start seeing more of the preferences of individual animals for particular habitats, 
we can create predictive mammal community maps to see uh, in other areas, um, we can try to predict what animals will be there. And that can help under-resourced areas uh, with, with their own conservation plans. More, la more layers of detail, detail. So in future surveys, looking at what is in the understory canopy, what is the ground cover in the area? And Aaron's gonna kind of be talking about coupling more of the information that we've been gathering with dark sky surveys to really understand which places are the most essential as conservation priorities. So thank you all for listening. Thank you, SIA instructors and viewers. And this is a Javelina who also wants to say thank you. <laughs> so thanks for watching everyone. Yeah.